Hey everyone, Mike Sattel here, and in this lesson, I'm going to talk about my top 10 geometry moves that I use to solve the hardest geometry questions on the SAT. Now for basic geometry stuff in the SAT, it's really just about memorizing some formulas, some, some definitions, things like that. And so for most of those easier questions, it's purely just, do you know this particular geometry fact? But the hardest geometry questions fluster people a lot and really frustrate them as well because they're so varied and so dense and so confusing. And so a lot of people, what they do is as they practice, they try to memorize the steps that they used to solve each and every uh, individual question that they come across. That is not a good way to study for the SAT, not just for the geometry part, but for really any part that involves hard questions because you're not going to see the exact question again on your SAT. So with the geometry, we don't want to memorize steps. We want to use the certain kinds of moves that no matter what the circumstances are going to move the question forward. That's how I think about it. These are not things I do in any particular order, but we will go in order in terms of what I think is the least to most important to think about for any hard geometry question. Mostly these are puzzles and these are moves that we can use to solve these puzzles more effectively. So let's start with number 10. This one might seem obvious to many of you, but I see it often overlooked. Remember, the SAT provides you with most of the geometry formulas in the reference sheet that's in the Blue Book app. So anytime you have a hard geometry question and you're stumped, move into this direction. Open the thing up and look at the formulas and see if anything rings a bell or looks familiar to the picture that you're given in this question. So it could be about volume. We've got all those formulas. I, In fact, I have a whole lesson breaking this thing down. I'll let you watch that for more details. But do not forget that this exists. And if you're stuck, open it up for inspiration. You never know. It might give you something that you can work with. Now, number nine, our number nine move here is also kind of a little bit obvious. We need to learn geometry definitions. Here are a few of them that I just kind of came up with for this lesson. There's probably more, but basically, especially if you are not a native English speaker, a lot of geometry terms are things that you learn in your native language, but then have a, a ver an English version that you need to know, obviously, for the SAT. So these are all things that I'll let you look up on your own. I'm not going to go through them here. Uh, I'm not going to make videos on everything. Like there's, I'm not going to make a lesson on isosceles triangles because that is such a common thing that you just need to go and look that up on your own. There's tons of stuff on the internet. But as you practice using real SAT questions, anytime you encounter a geometry word that's unfamiliar to you, it's your responsibility to look that up and try to figure out what it means because it's always going to mean the same thing. And the SAT is coming at these questions assuming that you have learned geometry in English and have a basic understanding of the vocabulary. So make sure you learn words like this and anything else that kind of fits in this category. Now, number eight, this is, I think, where we're starting to get into some puzzle solving here. Basically, anytime I have a, a question and it's it's got any sort of weirdness to it, my move is to make basic shapes. The basic shapes being circles, rectangles, and triangles. Pretty much everything in geometry is composed in some way of circles, rectangles, or triangles, okay? So that means we have our basic formulas that we can keep coming back to for those shapes even when the, the picture that they give us on the SAT gets crazy. So on the left there, you can see we have a square, which is a rectangle, inscribed in a circle. So I'm probably gonna, in some way, no matter what they're asking for, need to think about the formulas for the area or perimeter of a rectangle or a square, the area of a circle, that formula is given to me, the circumference of a circle is given to me. There's nothing weird about that picture, even though it may look that way. Similarly, when we have something that's kind of straight up weird, like a hexagon, I don't want to think in terms of hexagons because I don't know those formulas. They're not given to me in the reference sheet, and I'm not supposed to memorize any formulas with hexagons. So my goal is, can I break this thing down into simpler shapes, more basic shapes? And sure enough, and we'll talk more about this later, a hexagon can be broken up into six different triangles or that are actually not different at all. They're all the same. So we're always thinking, how can I take the weird, complicated things that they're giving me and bring them back to the simple, basic shapes that I know very, very very well. Number seven on our list here, put everything on the picture. I cannot stress how important this is. You have scratch paper for the SAT. Geometry is an excellent place to be using it. And anytime they tell you some piece of information, put it on the picture, no matter how unimportant it seems, it might help you out. So if they told us in a question that we have an equilateral triangle, I'd obviously draw one on my uh, scratch paper, and I know that an equilateral triangle has all equal sides. So I would put little marks to indicate that those sides are congruent. 
But I also know that an equilateral triangle has equal angles. And I know the measure of those angles is 60 degrees. Now, you may say that's obvious. I don't need to put that there, but you never know. I would put it on the picture so that you can see with your eyes that it's 60 degrees because, and this gets to move number six here, we sometimes need to solve a question by recognizing key numbers. And 60 is one of our key numbers because we know that 30, 60, 90 triangles exist. So as given here, there is no 30, 60, 90 triangle. But because I've written that 60 on my scratch paper, my brain is moving in that direction. And especially if I'm stuck, I might be thinking maybe there's a way to make one. If I make an altitude, I split that angle at the top into two 30s and I form a right angle and now I've got it, that 30, 60, 90. So no matter what, I'm always on the lookout for those numbers that you can see all the way on the left there that indicate something special is going on. Usually it's one of the special right triangles, but it doesn't have to be. So 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, 45 degrees, these are all angle measures that have a little bit of importance for lots of different geometry formulas. Similarly, those special right triangle formulas include measurements of radical two and radical three. So if that's involved in the question in some way, my mind is moving in that direction. It might not be a special right triangle, but at least the thought is crossing my mind. So you need to train your brain to notice those kinds of numbers in the same way that there's certain strong words that we need to notice when we're doing reading passage questions. So anytime I see one of those numbers on my picture, in the question, in the answer choices, my brain is moving towards those special things. So make sure you put everything on the picture so that if it's involved in the question in some way, you have a visual reminder to check those things. Now, number five is something that we don't get in the reference chart at all. This is what I call part over whole, and it specifically has to deal with circle sectors. Now, in school, I learned a bunch of different formulas for working with circle sectors, but part over whole just kind of takes them all and combines them. So you can kind of see at the bottom here what we're doing. Basically, we're representing that sector of the circle, which is kind of anchored on the center of the circle, and it's like a slice. We're representing it as a fraction. And we can represent any aspect of that sector that we want. So that's the part. And then the whole circle is kind of the denominator of the fraction. So you can see there, we could think about the area of the sector. And then we would put that part over pi r squared, which is the whole area of the circle. Similarly, we could think about the outside of the circle. The arc length for AB, the sector, is the numerator, whereas that's the same fraction and uh, of the entire circumference, 2 pi r. And in a lot of these cases, we are going to be thinking about the angle measure for the sector. So angle AOB, the central angle that this thing opens up from, is going to be the part of 360 because that's the whole number of degrees in a circle. So I hope to make more lessons about this particular topic. It is kind of tricky because it's not really talked about in that reference chart, but it is something that kind of rem reminds me of those basic shapes. Circles, obviously a basic shape. The slice or sector of a circle can also be thought of as kind of fundamental to a lot of questions. And a lot of times we're solving them, we're gonna be making fractions to represent that sector and we're gonna set be setting them equal to each other. Let's move on though to number four. This one's much easier to think about. Basically, we said basic shapes uh, are, can include triangles, but whenever you can, make triangles. And the reason is that triangles are just, of all the basic shapes, the most fundamental, the most useful. We have four different formulas in the reference sheet that are specifically about triangles. And so if we can take a weird shape and like we did with the hexagon before, break it up into triangles, now we have something that we can work with in lots of different ways. So the reference sheet definitely includes formulas for triangles. Trigonometry, the entire field of trigonometry, is basically a big old formula for right triangles. So Sokotoa, that idea we need to memorize, but that again relates to triangles. And so we also sometimes learn that triangles, uh, multiple triangles are similar to each other. And so there's things in involving their sides and angles that we're supposed to use. So basically, triangles have a lot of things that kind of orbit them and a lot of ideas that we can work with. So if you make triangles, it increases the chance that you're going to be able to use a formula or some sort of fact to kind of work through the question. So in whatever way you can, make some triangles is usually a good move for these hard geometry questions. Very similar to this. Number three, draw radiuses. If they give you a circle, odds are very good. Even if you don't know how you're gonna use this, just draw a radius and, and make a radius somewhere, make multiple radiuses if needed. But when you do that, my advice is to connect the dots. For some reason, some of you just draw a radius like left to right for, for no real reason. I don't know why this is a random line in the middle of nowhere. This doesn't do me any good. So that doesn't help. 
If I'm going to draw a radius, I'm going to draw one from the center of the circle to a, a dot, a point, something where something's happening on the edge of that circle, right? So there's one way I could do it. I could also do it for all of those little corners. And suddenly, guess what I just did? I made triangles. Remember, move number four. So we're moving things in the right direction here. And not only are they triangles, but since radiuses are congruent, all radiuses of a circle are the same measurement, that means that these are isosceles triangles. And those also have special properties about how the sides and the angles relate to each other. So drawing radiuses when you're given a circle question is a very safe move. You do not need to know how it's going to help you move the question forward, but odds are very good that it is going to do it in some way. So that's why we have our scratch paper and we put everything on the paper that we can and drawing radiuses and making triangles are two very reliable ways to add to your picture in a way that's going to move that question forward. Now, number two, if you've seen any of my other lessons, probably isn't a surprise. Uh, arithmetize is one of our main math strategies. It applies to geometry questions the same as it does to any other type of math question. And specifically here, what the SAT does sometimes with geometry is they take away the dimensions. They talk about shapes, they talk about lengths and widths and, and heights without giving you actual things. So sometimes they're talking about one single shape and they might ask us to compare dimensions. For example, they might say the length X of a rectangle is five more than the width. Well, you could build whatever equation they're asking for using that information, but my advice would be to pick a value for X if they don't ask for one for you to solve and give it a value so you can think about this better. Because if you write an equation where you have the dimensions of the rectangle as x and x plus 5, you are wrong, okay? That is not correct. The right versions would be x and x minus 5, and the, that is so much easier to understand if we just hypothetically for a second make our length equal to 20. Then we can say, oh, that 20 is 5 more than the width, so the width is 15. And we don't need to worry about these variables because we actually have numbers. And that's better for us because when we have real shapes in real life, they have actual dimensions. They are a certain number of inches, a certain number of feet, whatever it is, they have actual dimensions. So when the SAT takes those away, that should be worrying. That's probably them leading us into a trap. Similarly, and this is even worse, when they ask us not to compare dimensions, but to compare shapes, right? Two cylinders, a cylinder has twice the radius and half the height as a second cylinder with the same volume. That's going to be a lot to think about. And my intuition about how those two cylinders interact with each other is probably going to be wrong. So I'd much rather come up with some sort of radius, come up with some sort of height, do whatever changes they're asking me to do, and then think about the resulting volumes or whatever they are based on actual numbers. It is safer, and you really want to stay away from thinking about geometry situations in abstract ways, especially when they are hard geometry questions. It is a very high probability they're trying to trick you. And so by arithmetizing and getting up, getting real numbers in there, we completely eliminate, in many cases, the chance that we're going to get tricked. So really important uh, procedure there. And that brings us to number one. Of course, this should be no surprise, plug points into equations, our main math strategy. And notice that our number one here looks a lot like our number 10. And that's because I want to remind you that Geometry is not some special field of mathematics. We think of equations as having to do with the xy plane and lines and quadratics and exponentials, but geometry is full of equations too. That's what the reference sheet is telling us is there's so many formulas that we can work with and so many times the points that we're plugging in are a length and a width, a base and a height, a radius and a volume. So we really are just using the same strategies that we use for any other type of SAT math question. But for some reason, people think of geometry as a different thing. It's not that different. There's memorization that we need to do for sure, but a lot of it comes down to points and equations. We might not be able to graph those equations in Desmos, but we can still think about it as I want numbers in place of variables. And just simplifying it in those terms really, really makes a difference when you're trying to solve these complicated puzzles. But putting a formula, putting some sort of equation on your page is really useful. Most of them are given to us. We do have some that we need to memorize, like Sokotoa for trigonometry, that part of our whole thing I talked about before. But most of them are given. So try to get back to putting an equation on a page and plugging numbers into it. That is how I solve most geometry questions. Hopefully this was helpful. If it was, please give me a like, give me a subscribe. It really helps me out. These were very narrow strategies that we use specifically for geometry questions in many cases. If you're looking for those bigger picture strategies, make sure you check out my strategy series playlist, which is linked in the description. If you are looking for geometry uh, questions to practice with, I've done many videos from the College Board geometry questions on my site, so go check those out. But also, I've got plenty of questions that I've written, especially some twisted hard ones where I definitely use these moves quite a bit. So become a channel member and you can get any access to those. 
Thank you so much for watching. Once again, I am Mike Sattel. I really hope this helped. And remember, when it comes to your scores, don't settle for less. Sattel for more.